Rawr! Domo, who usually speaks Japanese, says, Happy Movember! And, welcome to a sort of strange smattering of IB, quantum, topic 13 physics stuff. We're going to start talking about how a mass spectrometer works to know the exact mass of an atom. Then we're going to leap over and talk about how the nucleus has different energy levels, or how we know that. And then we're going to talk about positron decay, which is really not that difficult, since you already know about beta decay. I think a mass spectrometer is pretty cool, because it combines an electrical field, a magnetic field, circular motion, atomic physics, and you can understand how one works. Clearly, you've reached a pinnacle of your existence. So this drawing, take a minute and pause it, draw it, or at least get your head around what in the world is happening. Now, what you see here is you have a ion source that's maybe heating up and firing across a voltage difference, probably some... Uh, particles, and they are charged particles, and they are then going to go flying in these parallel plates here. And since it's a charged particle, they're going to be pulled probably to one side or the other. But then there's very cleverly a magnetic field going into the page. And if you use your right hand rules abilities for magnetism, you'll see that there's an electrical force going one way, a magnetic force going the other, and it allows them to hopefully go straight if they have the right velocity. Now the way we say that's going to work is there's going to be an electrical force going one way, there's a magnetic force going the other way, and what we have is we have E times Q, we have the magnetic field strength here uh, times Q times V, it's Q's go away, and you're left with the fact that only the particles that have a very particular velocity based on this electrical field strength and magnetic field strength get through. The others get deflected downwards or upwards. So whoever thought of that is clearly a genius. Then these select particles with just the right velocity get in to this part. And as you remember, hopefully, from magnetism, they go in a circle when they're in a uniform magnetic field that's perpendicular to their velocity. And you can figure out how fast they're going if you use second law, because it's going in circular motion. You know this is V squared over R. And if you know anything about magnetic fields and forces, you know that this is still QVB. And then when you solve this for the mass, you're going to end up with something like QBR over the velocity. And these will curve around and they're going to hit this photographic paper. At least photographic paper maybe if you live in the 1960s. Probably now there's something a lot more complex. But what you want to notice is, is that if you have particles of high mass, then they have a bigger radius because these big chunky fat atoms can't curve around very well and if you have low mass then they can curve around or accelerate easily so then you have a smaller radius. A nice thing about a mass spectrometer is that isotopes can be separated because they've got the exact same charge but since they have different masses they're going to follow slightly different paths through the mass spectrometer. And a little-known piece of trivia, one of my best friends, this guy right here, is an actual mass spectrometrist, Lance Heinley is, because he can measure so precisely what the mass of particular atoms is, or maybe what the mass of particular compounds are. Now, just to flash back a little bit, if you remember when we were talking about the discrete energy levels of an atom, and you maybe saw this diagram that maybe is a little crazy. This was for the electrons, and you were just like, what is going on? There's all these photons flying off and all these discrete energy levels. Well, here's some bad news. The same type of thing not only exists for electrons, but also for the nucleus. So let's get rid of this. Let me show you a new diagram. If we have a radium atom, let's say, and it decays through alpha decay, which would be this particle here, into radon. There's some evidence 
that the nuclei that it decays into has discrete energy levels. And that's because when this decays with an alpha particle, it gives off only two possible energies, 4.59 mega electron volts or this higher 4.78. Nothing any smaller than those, nothing bigger than those, and certainly nothing in between. Now the reasoning that it gives off this lower energy one, because it's making a form of radon 222 that's a little cracked out and it's pretty excited and hyperactive and so it then has to decay down to the lower ground state of that nucleus and it gives off this guy which is a gamma particle. Now the other route that it could decay is it could just go straight down to that ground state and give off a more energetic alpha particle of 4.78 and then no gamma ray and you never get any energies in between, so you know that nucleus, in some bizarre way, must have different energy levels. I don't know what that would look like, but seems to all the evidence seems to support that it really happens that way. Positron decay will be incredibly easy to understand if you have already studied uh, beta decay, which hopefully, well, more than likely you probably have gotten this far. Now, beta decay would occur, occur when you had uh, too many neutrons. Uh, but here we have not enough neutrons in this situation. And so what's going to happen is, as an example, we've got neon right here, and it only has nine neutrons. So we're going to say too few of those. Neon is a little sad. So what it's going to do is it's going to take one of its protons, and that proton, at least I think is what happens, it's going to give off a beta particle, which is a, like a, it's a positron. Um, it's a beta positive particle. Um, and that's the same mass as an electron, but a positive charge, equally positive as that of an electron. And then this thing here, is the neutrino. If you remember in beta decay, it was an anti-neutrino. But now it's just a regular neutrino. And if you notice, our proton number goes up because you got rid of a positively charged uh, particle. No, sorry, the proton number goes down because you got rid of a positively charged particle. And since that proton turned into a neutron, your neutron number has now gone up. And the way this would look in equation form is this here where here we've got our parent fluorine sorry it's just F uh, is the daughter this is our positron and here is our very light and doesn't like to react with matter neutrino here. And this positron is, what's cool is it's antimatter. If it met up with another electron, they would have a very brief and catastrophic love affair where they destroy each other and give off a lot of energy. The very generic equation that you can see for this reaction is this here. 